Copenhagen, the capital city of Denmark, once again played host to glory in picturesque Scandinavia for Glory 40. Two native countrymen made a triumphant return in front of their home crowd. The middleweights took to the ring in the one-night four-man contender tournament, and a title fight between two bitter rivals highlighted an action-packed night. All this and more coming your way next on Rewind. We begin the evening with highlights from the Super Fight Series. First up, a featherweight matchup between Chris Mosseri of the U.S. and Yu Hongxi of China, making his glory debut. Mark, our first fight is over, and it sure was exciting. Yeah, it started off with Mosseri with a lot of good pressure until he got caught at the end of the first round with that right hand from Xi, which made the fight really interesting from that point. Masieri started off well in the beginning of the second round, started using some pressure, but Yuhan Shi did a good job at changing angles with his punches, using his counter punches, and landing good uppercuts on the inside. Here are the final statistics, our impact timeline. The flash there you see in the upper right-hand corner is for the knockdown, came at the end of round number one, and then after that, pretty even. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of kickboxing, we go to the judges' scorecard. Here are the totals from our five ringside judges. One scores it 29-27. The other four have it 30-26. A unanimous decision for your winner, Yu Hong Shi. After suffering his first loss in the glory ring, American Richard Abraham had a tough task as he faced Jamie Bates, winner of the UK's Road to Glory. Here's some highlights from Richard Abraham and Jamie Bates. Yeah, and it was a lot of Jamie Bates really staying long, staying active on the outside, really catching Abraham as he was coming in, trying to throw different strikes. He showed different variations of his boxing, showed good kicks. Um, in my opinion, Jamie Bates stealing the first two rounds by staying long. But in round three, it was Richard Abraham who did a better job at staining his ground, countering back. But Jamie Bates just shows that his height, his reach, his distance control is going to be a tough one for a lot of the welterweights in the division. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds, we go to the judges' scorecard. Here now are the totals from our five ringside judges. One has the bout 29-28. The other four all score at the same 30-27. A unanimous decision for your winner, Jamie Bates. With the upset, Richard Abraham drops to number eight in the welterweight division, while England's Jamie Bates appears to be another in a growing list of ones to watch. Coming up on Rewind, the long-awaited title rematch between Jason Wilmus and Simon Marcus for the middleweight championship of the world. But up next, the four-man one-night contender tournament, and two native Danish countrymen look to return to glory as they fight in front of their home fans. Glory 40 Copenhagen featured a one-night four-man middleweight contender tournament with the winner earning a future title shot. Three of the top six ranked fighters in the division did battle. Highlights from the first semifinal saw fifth-ranked Yusri Belgari up against sixth-ranked Agron Pratini. Here are our opening highlights from our first bout of the evening. Yeah, and this fight was all about that long reach of Belgari. He was able to keep Pratini at the end of his punches, land very good low kicks, and in that second round, he was able to score a nice knockdown via low kicks. And he continued to use straight punches and low kicks. And pretend he didn't have an answer to that reach. He tried coming in a few times, but it just shows the development of Belgari being able to stay patient, keep his distance, and fight his fight. Here are the total strike stats. Punches lean towards the Croatian, but other than that, it was all about Yusuri Belgari. Strikes absorbed, 27 shots for the Tunisian. Keep that in mind, he does fight again later tonight. If he wins, let's make it official with Tim Hughes. 
Ladies and gentlemen, after three tournament rounds, we go to the judges' scorecard. All five of our ringside judges score them about the same 30-26. A unanimous decision for your winner, who now advances to the tournament final, Yusri Belgari. So with the victory, Belgari awaits the winner of semifinal two, where third-ranked Alex Pereira went up against Barim Rama of Sweden who was making his glory debut. Let's jump right back into our highlights from this, the second middleweight contender tournament final, semifinal. And the highlights are all Alex Pereira showing good composure, lots of experience, and just was able to pick his shots with his boxing, was able to find a good right knee knockdown in the first round. In the second round, he continued to just pick his shots, finally mixing up levels with his left hook, causing the second knockdown. And then in round three was very similar, just finding right hands over and over again until finally the third knockdown and the TKO victory for Alex Pereira. Here are our final statistics. Strikes absorbed, 58 headshots to Barim Rama. Alex Pereira with a fantastic performance here tonight, but he's still got one to go. Let's make this thing official into the ring in Tim Hughes. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an official time of one minute, 42 seconds of that third and final round. This bout comes to an end by way of the glory maximum knockdown rule. For your winner, my technical knockout, now advancing to the tournament final, Alex Pereira! With Pereira's third round KO of Rama, it set the stage for the finals between third ranked Pereira and fifth ranked Belgari. Ready, fight! Belgarwi wearing the white gloves, Pereira in the black. Pereira right away wanted to establish oh. his boxing. Oh. Fight. I really liked how Belgarwi, Belgarwi fought in that first fight, really using his jab and his low kick. That can be a great strategy against Pereira as well. Again, Pereira has won a glory tournament before, knows what he's doing. As for Bulgarwi, he lost the last time he was in a tournament to the eventual winner of said tournament. Israel Adesanya, who went on to challenge Jason Wilness for the middleweight championship of the world back in Los Angeles. Must be a little strange for Bulgari after fighting someone who was six inches shorter than him. Now he's fighting someone who's almost the same size. And there's a bit of a redness and swelling on the right foot of Belgarwi. We don't know how serious it is, but right now we haven't noticed a limp or any hesitation to throw the right leg. I would like to see him throw it. If, if possible, that right low kick's gonna be a, a good weapon for him. Try to shut down that boxing of Pereira, but Pereira's very confident in wanting to move forward, wanting to control the center of the ring, try to land his hands. Both men have one punch knockout power. Those punches come from a long way away when you're as tall as these two guys are. Bogarwi, Dutch, but of Tunisian parentage. Very proud of his Tunisian roots, but does fight and train out of Amsterdam at Mike's gym. Pereira has traveled the world chasing his dream, fighting out of Rio, or Sao Paulo, Brazil, rather. From Brazil to Copenhagen, Denmark, with a possibility of winning an opportunity to fight for the middleweight championship of the world. Right now, it's Pereira controlling the center of the ring, but Belgarwi's fighting really well on fighting backwards. He's still landing more, he's more active. It seems to be getting the best of the exchanges. Uppercut connects. Snapping Pereira's head back. We've seen in past fights, Pereira can and does get hit. Yeah, we saw even in his last fight where he beat Israel Adesanya. Adesanya was beating him most of the round until he caught um, Israel coming in. And now it's Pereira. Not at the back, okay? Fight! Spinning back kick there from Pereira. 
He eats a right hand. Pereira needs to be more busy this round. Let's see if he can maybe mix in some kicks and not just heavily rely on his punches. Nice job of Belgarwi to back Pereira up. And now he's trying to fight off the ropes. Stop. Stop. Next time. Tobias Harris, our referee, trying to lay down the wrong. There's that low kick I've been liking from Belgarwi. You can see total strikes, the edge goes to Belgarwi. Oh, a left from Belgarwi backs Pereira up. That might have really hurt him. Yusri needs to stay long. I like when he's staying long, using his jab, following his right hand behind. It's Pereira who wants to bring him into the more of the heavy exchanges. A short right connects for Belgarwi. And Pereira is letting Belgarwi rack up some points here with those little short shots. Belgari being busy is his best strategy. It's shutting down the, the output of Pereira. Might not have a lot behind it, but a landed punch is a landed punch. Ooh, Pereira missed that one by about six inches. I like that Belgari's mixing up his strikes as well. He's using his low kicks, he's trying to mix in knees, where Pereira's just focusing on landing the one big shot. Straight right hand connects again to Pereira, and then a left hook from Belgarwi. Doesn't look like Pereira has much behind his punches anymore. Starting to fatigue really quickly. We've seen this before from Pereira, where he starts to get behind on the scorecards. Seems like he's out of a fight, and then all of a sudden, one punch or one kick's all it takes. And there's that one punch, a right hand. Belgarwi says it didn't hurt him, but we all know it did. Best punch of the fight for Pereira, who's trying to follow it up with a left hook, but swings and misses. That one moment for Pereira may not have been enough, though. Another solid statistical round for Belgarwi. Round three of a scheduled three. The winner advances to fight for the middleweight championship of the world. Belgarwi fighting out of Netherlands, wearing the white gloves, Pereira from Brazil in the black. I feel that ankle of Belgarwi starting to add up. He kind of stumbled under it. But a lot of fighters seem to be slipping on the canvas, complaining it's a little slippery. Kick a tip there and a big left hand swing and miss for Pereira. It's almost like he's reserving his energy for a few seconds to throw one of those bombs. Well, Bel Belgari does get excited. He keeps his hands down in exchanges. So Pereira's best option right now, if he's fatiguing, is to try to counter punch while Belgari trying to come while he's trying to come in. A much better start to round three here for the Brazilian, who goes with a right to the body. You can see how fatigue is playing a factor, though. It looks like Belgarwi's fresher. Pereira is finding hook. some success. And another left hook. How much gas is in the tank, though? A slip there from Belgarwi, and he ate a punch as well. He's done that a few times. I think it's his right angle being damaged and swollen. If Joseph Altolini scores correct and that Belgarwi won the first two rounds, then Pereira needs a 10-8 round here. Whether it's a knockdown or a point reduction, whatever it is, that's what he needs.
The jab has certainly been effective for Belgarwi. Haven't seen a lot of that from Pereira. And how much of a factor was rest for this fight? Belgarwi fought first tonight, had more downtime. Well, it could be a big advantage, and it looks like either the rest helped or Yusri Belgarwi is just Stop. in better shape. Stop. Fight. 20 seconds to go. Ten Fight. seconds to go here in our final. Pereira throws a lunging right hand. Did not do the trick. Fight. Is Yusuri Belgarwi headed to a title shot? He outlanded Alex Pereira 89 to 40. All five of our ringside judges see them out the same and score at 30 27. A unanimous decision for your winner. And now, Glory Contender Tournament Champion, Yusri Belgari. In impressive fashion, Yusri Belgari survives and earns himself a future title shot. The victory moves him up three spots and is now ranked second, only behind Simon Marcus, who will be fighting later in a rematch against Jason Wilness. We next turn to the highlights of two fighters making their homecoming. First up was Mohammed Desert Storm Elmir in what he admitted was a must win. He went up against the Fury, Simon Santana, in featherweight action. All right, let's take a look at some of the highlights from this fight's action. And it was that early right hand of Santana that kept catching Elmir, which I gave the first round to Santana. But Elmir started picking up the pace, started landing straight rights of his own, and two questionable knockdowns that could have easily gone to Elmir. But Elmir showed great conditioning and constantly pushing the pace, landing some good punches. But that grit and that Simon Santana combo back kept throwing that big right hand, showing his will to win. But it feels like Elmir feels like he won in front of his hometown. Simon Santana also seems somewhat confident. Let's find out who's right as we look now at our final strikes by round. Obviously, round three going to Muhammad Elmir. Round two, also the edge to the man from Denmark. Round one, leaning towards the Norwegian. Ladies and gentlemen, after three hard-fought rounds, we go to the judges' scorecard. All five of our ringside judges see the bout the same and score it 29-28 for your winner by unanimous decision, Mohamed Elmir. Following a nearly three-year absence and a successful return to the glory ring in Chicago, sixth-ranked Nicholas Larson returned home to his native Denmark. His opponent, third-ranked Yodkun Pan Sitmon Chai of Thailand with the winner well positioning himself in the lightweight division. As our lightweight battle between Nicholas Larson and Yuk Kumpan just went final. And it was Larson staying active and busy on the outside, using his jab, establishing the pace and the momentum of the fight where Yuk Kumpan was had sporadic moments where he was trying to counter with big punches, but just wasn't active enough in my opinion. And the activity of Larson made him the fight. I, I go three rounds to zero on my unofficial scorecard. Larson promised that tonight he'd look as good as he ever has. He pretty much did. You come on, just could not find an answer. And true to form, Nicholas Larson, maybe the nicest guy we've ever dealt with from a fighter perspective here at Glory, picks his opponent up and celebrates his performance. Strikes absorbed to the head and to the body. And how about Sid Munchai not landing one single body shot? Yeah, he was really focusing on low kicks and, and attacking the head where punching the body could have been a good strategy for him. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of kickboxing, we go to the judges' scorecard. Here are the totals from our five ringside judges. Three of them see the bout 29-28. The remaining two score at 30-27. A unanimous decision. All for your winner, Nicholas Larson. 
With the emotional victory, Nicholas Larson moves up two spots and is now ranked fourth in the lightweight division. Still to come, it's the revenge rivalry rematch between Jason Wilness and Simon Marcus for the middleweight title. But up next in lightweight and light heavyweight action, knockouts take center stage. Welcome back to Glory 40 Rewind from Copenhagen, Denmark. In another key lightweight matchup, fifth-ranked Josh Johnson of Canada took on ninth-ranked Antonio Gomez of Spain. Yeah, and it's a tough fight because it's going to be the pressure fighting of Gomez where Johnson's going to look to fight a little bit more on the outside, keep his distance, and fight more on his heels rather than coming forward. But he is an emotional fighter who does like to come forward when he gets um, anxious and, and really wants to counter back. Johnson also likes to flash out some spectacular offense every now and then, so keep an eye on a spinning back fist, perhaps a couple elbows to the jaw. And what Johnson does well is he really mixes his combinations well. You're going to see him trying to use good low kicks, where Gomez is going to try to get his head on the inside and really use his, his left hook, and that's his most dangerous weapon. You mentioned that Josh Johnson did indeed train in Holland right after school, but not before he worked as a plumber for a year to save up enough money to make that trip to Europe. So Josh Johnson willing to do whatever it takes to get better in this sport. And even while he was there, he was able to train with guys like UFC fighter Jose Aldo, so he did gain a lot of experience. So far, the tornado, Antonio Gomez, has not showed us that whirlwind power. A little bit of a feeling out process here for the first half of round one. That's what makes Gomez very dangerous. John C. doesn't want to sit against those ropes for too long because Gomez is going to put some good combinations together. John C. coming off a loss to Christian Baia. That was a real stunner, Joe. No one thought Baia could win that fight, and yet he did. And I know John C. felt like he needed to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, he also felt like it should have went an extra round, too, but both of those kids are so young and so talented. I'm excited to see Baia back as well. It's hard to believe Josh Johnson, not even 25 yet, has so much glory experience at the highest level. Outside low kick stands Johnson up from Antonio Gomez. Gomez fighting with a heavy heart tonight. His father died a month and a half ago at the age of 59 due to cancer, has dedicated this performance to his memory. Straight right hand snuck through the guard of Johnson. Gomez is doing a good job at landing those power combinations where Johnson's trying to use his jab, but it seems like Gomez is getting the better in the exchanges. You saw the lightning quick speed there from Johnson. Oh, you can hear that ring throughout this arena. John C. did spend time in Thailand, and he was telling us how he knew he had power in the kicks when the Thais would look at each other and, and nod of approval when John C. hit the pad. So now he's a little bit more confident throwing that right kick. The proof is in the sound, almost like when you get a real sweet baseball swing. Round two, scheduled three. John C. in the white gloves, Gomez in the black. So we really need to see Gomez continue to, to pressure. Oh, that head kick wobbled Gomez. He goes down. They don't call it a knockdown. Did his knee touch? I'm not sure. It may still do so eventually because Johnson has him wobbled. There's that power in the right kick, which started it all. But this is what Johnson needed earlier in that first round. So he should be a little bit more active. On oh, that knee connects as well. Johnson's warming up now. This is where he gets very dangerous. Once John C. gains momentum, that's where he starts putting combinations together and looks uh, amazing when he does it. Blood pouring out of the face somewhere of Antonio Gomez, who looked at his gloves almost as if, what's going on here? Yeah, but even in, when Gomez's fight in Germany against Bakiri, once he got knocked down, that's when Gomez started waking up a little bit. And that's when he won, and in my opinion, won the last two rounds of that first uh, fight. It may actually be a cut on his chin. Probably from that knee. So the doctor will take a look at this cut.
Boy, that does, there's a lot of beard hair there, but <laughs> it's hard that's to see. Horrible looking cut. It was that perfectly oh. timed right knee by Johnson. How did Gomez stand up after that? And that, they're going to wave it off. He cannot continue. A horrible gash delivered by a massive knee from Josh Johnson. It's over. And Johnson back in the win column, his sixth victory here in glory. Sad that it had to end that way. It was really opening up. Ladies and gentlemen, you watched it as it happened. We have an official time of one minute and five seconds of that second round. This one's end by Dr. Stoppage. For your winner, by technical knockout, Josh Johnson. In impressive fashion, Josh Johnson moves up two spots and holds the number three ranking. Could this be the year Johnson gets his title shot? That was followed by the light heavyweights as seventh ranked Freddy Camayo of France took on the problem child, Ahmad Hadar of Morocco, 15 years his junior. In many ways, this is a boy versus a man, a 19-year-old versus a 34-year-old seasoned veteran who just ate a front kick to the chin. And Hadar's not wasting any time making an impact. No, he's in a very aggressive style. So I anticipated him coming out really hard like this, but he's got to be careful jumping in like that, eating a nice overhand from K K Kamayo. Kamayo does have 46 wins by knockout. So you're right about being careful if you're the problem child. But Hadar had to take this fight because he said nobody wants to fight him. So he doesn't really have a choice to, but to fight those higher experienced guys. He's so confident in speaking with him the other day. Says he's already ready for a title opportunity. He wants to go right to the top, not waste any time. He doesn't want to win on points, wants to win by knockout. Ahmad Hadar. And is that a knockdown? I guess not. And if you're Freddie Camayo, when you find out that Glory's putting you against this 19-year-old newcomer, is that almost a slap in the face? Like, you know what? We want this guy to look good. We think he can beat you. Well, I think Camayo knows that he's still a dangerous opponent, no matter how young he is. But you can see the pressure, and Hadar's going to keep coming in there and throwing bombs, but he needs to watch out for the counter-punching of Kamayo. Right hand to the body from Hadar. It looks like Kamayo's just content with counter-punching. He's not really doing, throwing too much volume. Couple good body shots there from Hadar. Kamayo calls himself a lion with a ton of experience, and he's going to eat Hadar alive. But right now, he just ate a head kick. Yeah, he doesn't seem to be doing much. He's he's too content with waiting and counter punching. So this is where Hadar needs to stay long and, and stay active and not get overly aggressive. Pick his shots. Cutting the weight like Kamayo did, and I would assume the pounds and the muscle structure as well. How does that play into a fighter's physique and to his mentality in there? Well, it all depends how he approached his weight cut. If he waited to the last minute, yes, it could affect you. But if he did his homework and started cutting weight from early in his camp, it shouldn't be a problem. Oh, and a straight right hand. That, oh, Paul Nichols. Deciding that was not an official knockdown. Some people may second guess that decision. But Kamayo woke up. Round two scheduled for three. Kamayo in the white gloves, Hadar wearing black. And Hadar does have an experienced team behind him. He trains with uh, Ishmael Lance, former team. He also goes to Hemmer's gym quite often to get sparring with Earl Zimmerman. Um, and all the, the great fighters that Hemmer's gym has. Yeah, we asked him if he was concerned about Freddie Camayo's power. He said, listen, I spar with Jamal Ben Sadiq. I am not scared of Freddie Camayo. Jamal Sadiq coming off a win over Guto Innocent. There was rumors he might fight Rico Verhoeven next month, but apparently suffered an injury and could not take the fight. Instead, it'll be Rico Verhoeven versus Ismail Lazar. May 20th, 
and Den Bosch, the Netherlands, straight right hand connects for Camayo. Camayo's doing well when he's when he's throwing, so he needs to continue to throw those one twos down the middle, but he needs to be more active. It seems like Hadar is waiting a little bit more and being a little bit more patient this round. Hadar expended a lot of energy in the beginning parts of that first round. A couple of running knees, flying knees. So now they're both starting to settle in. Let's see if the experience of Kamayo can shine through. Well, this is where Kamayo needs to keep the fight. And that's a knockdown. It looked like one of those shots clipped the jaw of Hadar. It almost looked like he was setting up some sort of spinning attack and lost his balance. We'll have to see the replay, but obviously Hadar is frustrated and now has to really press the attack. Yeah, I guess he, because he's caught. Hadar ate that right hand. Sorry, Joe. Now Kamayo teeing off and Hadar takes a knee. The problem child is in big trouble. Is he going to get up? Paul Nichols said it's over. All right, let's take a look at some of the knockdowns, some of the action from this fight. It started off with Hadar doing well, but Kamayo's experience started to show. And there was that first knockdown, which didn't really look like a damaging shot. But nonetheless, Hadar ended up on the canvas. And here was that second knockdown where Kamayo continued to put the pressure, attack levels with his punches, and just too much power, I guess, to the body. And Hadar goes down and didn't get up for the count. Let's make it official with Tim Hughes. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, you watched it as it happened. We have an official time of two minutes, 21 seconds of that second round when our referee, Paul Nichols, steps in to wave this one off for your winner by technical knockout, Freddy Camayo! Not ready just yet to give way to the youth movement, Freddy Camayo notches his 68th career victory and 47th by knockout. It's now time to settle a score when current glory middleweight champion Jason Wilness looks to defend his title for the second time from the man he took it from, number one ranked Simon Marcus. That's coming up next. This has been six months in the making. The rubber match and second time with the middleweight title on the line. Current champion Jason Wilness wants to prove this will be no different than their last title fight, won by Wilness with a third round TKO. On the other hand, number one ranked Simon Marcus has had nothing but revenge on his mind since losing his title to Wilness at Glory 33, New Jersey. And tonight, he wants it back in one of Glory's great rivalries for the middleweight championship of the world. World title fight, I expect you to fight like a world title. Touch gloves if you like. They don't touch gloves. Judge. They despise Judge. each other. Judge. Can they keep their emotions in check? Will they keep what? their emotions in check? Should they? Here we go. Five rounds in the middleweight division for the championship of the world. Jason Wilness, the champion, wearing the white gloves. Simon Marcus, the challenger, in the black. And this fight is about Wilness really trying to control the center of the ring where Simon's going to try to stay long on the outside and use his left kick and a lot of those left knees that he found success with. But that's going to be tough against those low kicks and inside punching of Wilness. In their last fight, it was Simon Marcus who came out and looked amazing for the first two or three minutes and then let his guard down. And Jason Wilness just started teeing off and won the fight with a knockout. And Simon for this fight went to Thailand and he trained with Buakau Banchamak back in Thailand, um, K1 kickboxing legend. So for Simon, that's a lot of confidence coming in here, sticking to his Muay Thai roots. And one of the best assets that Jason Wilness has is his ability to absorb punishment. He will get hit with punches and kicks, but seemingly can walk through just about anything. But a lot of those shots that people throw at Wilness are blocked off his guard. He stays calm under his shell and his shield, and then counters right back. Break. 
This is the second title defense for Jason Wilness. Eats a body kick there. And what Jason Wilness does well is if Simon throws a kick, Wilness counters right back. So he shuts down the kicks of Simon by countering right back. As far as skills go, Joe, where does Jason Wilness have an edge? Well, it's that pressure fighting and getting on the inside. His inside boxing and low kicks are what makes Wilness very dangerous. Where Simon's advantage is staying on the outside and watch out for that left kick. I've sparred with Simon many times in the past and that left kick is very difficult to get around. I want to thank those of you watching in the United States on ESPN2 and around the world on ESPN3 in over 170 countries. It's the middleweight championship of the world, the final fight of a trilogy between Simon Marcus and Jason Wilness. Shout out to all the Canadians watching and supporting back home in Toronto. My hometown also. A big following for Simon Marcus in Canada for sure. Wilness just as popular in the Netherlands. Jason Wilness's brother, Jafar Wilness, a heavyweight fighter, has had a lot of success as well. He's in his brother's corner tonight. What did you make of this round one? Not a ton of action, Joe. Surprised at all. Well, it's very patient, and I think that's what Simon has to do. And that's Wilness's strategy. He likes to come in, stay calm the first two rounds, and by round three, he really picks it up. He's trying to control the center. He needs, Simon needs to dictate the pace, and that's what Howard's telling him. So the smaller that Jason Wilness can make this ring, the better. That's right. He's going to constantly, pr he doesn't move back. He's going to take the absorption off of his guard and counter back with those kicks or those punches. And for those of you just watching Glory Kickboxing for the first time, type in Jason Wilness or Simon Marcus on YouTube for pad work. And you'll see how hard these kicks truly are. They can blast. It's amazing that another human being doesn't fall straight down when they're hit with them. Both exchanging kicks. Like that one. Simon focusing on the left body kick and, and, and hitting the body where Wilness attacks the legs. Strikes landed so far, 28 to 16. Simon Marcus with the edge. Who did you give round one to, Joe? Well, there was. It's very equal in, in damage, but it seems like Simon's activity and being a lot busier has won him that round. But judges can be looking at that pressure fighting as an advantage. At the top of the broadcast, we asked you your keys to glory for Simon Marcus, and you said he basically just has to stay away and not really get involved in a brawl. Is that what he's doing so far? Well, he's being a little bit more active on the outside, which is good, but I still feel that he needs to stay a little bit more defensive up top because I saw Wilness really do a good job at changing levels with his punches. Last time they fought, Simon Marcus was taunting Jason Wilness, put his hands down, tried to do a little Roy Jones action, and got caught. He hasn't been that foolish so far tonight. But you can see, yes, Simon was more active in that first round, but it doesn't seem to be affecting Wilness at all. He just continually walks forward. And when he does get hit, he counters right back with something that does damage. And you'll see Simon Marcus's his legs move a little bit. According to MMA Oddsbreaker, the champion, Jason Wilness, a slight favorite, minus 135, which means you bet $135 to win 100. Nice left hook by Wilness. Oh, what a body kick by Simon Marcus. But again, it doesn't seem to phase Wilness. Another knee, too. I like when Wilness throws his left hook to the body. Again, right to the rib cage. But already you can see the redness building up from those left kicks of Simon. Another good output round for Simon Marcus, who's almost landed twice as many strikes as Jason Wilness. Fight. Round three of a scheduled five here. We are live in Copenhagen, Denmark. This middleweight title fight between Simon Marcus and Jason Wilness. So that second round I'm going to give to Wilness. He's doing a lot more damage when he lands. He seems to be walking past everything Simon has to throw. And remember, a lot of those kicks that Simon are throwing are off the arm of Wilness. 
Some are landing, but a lot of them are off the, the forearm of Wilness. So you're not buying into these total strike statistics that we're putting up on the screen where Simon Marcus has landed 63 to Wilness' 37. Well, you got to remember the second scoring criterion glory is damage. And it seems like every time Wilness throws, he's doing a little bit more damage. And look at the body kicks. Incredible, 25 to 0. But for every body kick that Simon throws, Wilness is returning with a low kick. So if we were to see low kick stats, you would see Wilness dominating in that category. Maybe we'll see those, Joe. Ask and you shall receive, perhaps. There you go. Leg kicks. Wilness 17, Marcus 9. And Wilness got a right hand through there, which backed Simon Marcus up for a second. See, this is where Simon needs to get out of. He can't be comfortable sitting in, in the corners. Simon Marcus, a former Muay Thai light heavyweight world champion. And why has Simon Marcus been so successful at transitioning from Muay Thai to kickboxing, perhaps better than any other Muay Thai fighter we've ever seen? Well, one, because he's an exceptional athlete and he's a martial artist. He, he just doesn't train for fights. He fights all year round. Fighting is, is his life. So. Those transitions are easy when you're a, a phenomenal athlete like Simon. At least he makes it look easy. The respective trainers for both these fighters told us they are in the shape of their lives. No excuses as far as conditioning goes for either Wilness or Marcus. Another low kick from Wilness. Simon continuing with those kicks, but the story is Wilness throwing right back. What are the judges looking at here? Are they going to be more impressed with the output of Simon Marcus or the damage of Jason Wilness? That's what makes this tough very difficult to score. Those knees of Simon are doing well. Now Wilness on the inside, wants to trade going to the end of round three. Nice low kick. Beautiful low kicks, mixing up inside and outside. I have a feeling that they're a little bit concerned of the knees of Simon. So maybe that little bit of extra space will avoid the knees and help with Wilness counterpunching. We are in the championship rounds now, rounds four and five still to come. So from what I gathered, it's gonna be Wilness really trying to still hit the body and use his low kicks where Simon's going to continue to use his knees and kicks on the outside. This has been a razor close fight thus far. Neither man, except for perhaps Simon Marcus in the first round, has made a definitive statement. But Simon Marcus may be a little hurt here, ate a couple of punches, but continues to walk forward. And sometimes the best defense in kickboxing can be your offense. And that's exactly what Simon Marcus did after eating those punches. And what Simon's trying to use that kick to try to slow down the boxing of Wilness, but Wilness just does a good job at mixing in counter hooks or counter low kicks. Simon Marcus may be getting a little sloppy right now. Do you sense some fatigue setting in? Well, I started seeing a little bit in the third round. I'm seeing it a little bit from both fighters, but it still looks like Jason Wilness that every time he does hit, he's doing more damage. Good low kicks by Wilness. He needs to keep up with those right low kicks. We haven't seen a braggadocious Simon Marcus like we've seen in the past. So maybe he decides just to change his game plan up tonight. Play it more straight. Well, he does seem a little bit more fatigued, but this is where if Simon is going to want to pick up and get a little bit emotional, it's going to be in this or the fifth round. And the statistics are closing rapidly. Earlier, Simon Marcus had a massive edge, but now it's 97 strikes landed for Marcus, 89 for Wilness. Simon just ate a big shot there. He landed an uppercut, but Wilness just came back and countered right away. 
An extremely competitive fight here for the middleweight championship of the world. It's almost becoming an I hit you, you hit me type of fight. Oh, and a right hand now. And the hands are down by the waist for Marcus. The same kind of fight that Simon got. He's starting to get emotional and sit in the pocket with his chin up. And a knee there from Marcus. They're both leaving it all in the ring for sure. Marcus with those knees that have been landing all night long. He's, he's, landing, coming. he's landing good knees, but I'm not sure why he's not respecting the counter punches of Wilness. And there they come. One round to go and a late parting shot. Jason Psycho Wilness, the champ. We are live in Copenhagen, Denmark. Glory 40. And immediately, Marcus backs right up into the corner. Something his corner told him not to do. Well, maybe it's his fatigue factor, and he's going to look to counter punch now. I don't think Jason Wilness has taken a backward step all night long. No, he never does. And that's what I said earlier. He has one style. There's no surprise how Jason Wilness is going to fight, but he's just so effective and so good at this pressure fighting and counter fighting. He's just stalking Simon Marcus around the ring. So what's your message if you're in the corner of Simon Marcus right now? Well, it's just going to have to be to put something together. If The problem is when Simon opens up too much with his hands, he's, he's leaving his chin way too high and his hands too low. So Wilness has the advantage in the punch exchanges. In my opinion, he's going to have to stay outside, keep kicking, and hope to land a good knee. Maybe some good front kicks on the outside, but this inside fighting of Wilness is just too good right now. By far the best weapon for Simon Marcus has been knees. A lot of good left kicks too, but they just don't seem to be powerful enough to slow Wilness down. You can see the redness under the right arm of Jason Wilness. That tells the tale of what those body kicks have been able to do. And now Wilness right where he wants to be, inside. Just over a minute to go here. This fight still could be up for grabs, no doubt about it. No, this is a better round, even though Simon's fighting backwards. He is landing better this round. Body shot there from Wilness. Simon Marcus answers with a low kick. Couple jabs. Marcus switching to southpaw, back to orthodox. Both exchanging good body punches. 30 seconds left. from Wilness. Does he have enough energy to follow that up? There's a low kick. That's what he does well, mixes his punches and his low kicks. And a one-two from Wilness. And now they'll let it all hang out as we go to the bell. And that will do it. Glory 40. And the middleweight championship of the world in the books, Joe, a lot of highlights. Well, yeah, there was a lot of highlights, but it's a lot of the same type of action. It, but it was Simon Marcus who started off really good at being active, threw a lot of left kicks, um, some good knees, staying on the outside. But as the fight progressed, Wilness was just walking through that volume, countering right back, landed some really good low kicks, some good body punches, some good hits to the head. So it was that really that Simon trying to stay long, use his kicks, where Wilness just, his pressure styling seemed to be a little bit too much for Simon as he continued to block him down and counter right back. Looking on social media, it seems like everyone has it three rounds to two, but half the fans have it for Wilness and half the fans have it for Marcus. Here's the way the statistics show the story. Strikes by round, the first two rounds to Simon Marcus, but after that, Jason Wilness closed the gap in a hurry. But you need to remember, we're not looking at, we're also looking at damage and who is doing more damage. 
The left kicks of Simon were a lot of times off of the arm of Wilness, but every time Wilness countered, he was doing well and doing damage. So you can see from the strikes absorbed, you know, it was Wilness really attacking the head, where Simon was really focusing on that left body kick, which a lot of times landed off the arm. Without further ado, the official decision, here's Tim Hughes. Ladies and gentlemen, after five championship rounds, we go to the judges' scorecard. Our five ringside judges give us back a split decision. Here now are the totals. They score this bout 48-47, Marcus. 48-47, Wilness. 49-46, Wilness. 49-46, Marcus. And our fifth and final judge scores the bout 48-47 for your winner. And new glory middleweight champion of the world, Simon Marcus! In the narrowest of margins, Simon Marcus reclaims the belt from Jason Wilness. It seems that with this battle settled, the debate over who the better fighter is rages on. For the first time in glory history, it's looking like a third title fight between these two great fighters. Stay tuned, this rivalry is just heating up. That will do it for this edition of Rewind. We'll be back following Glory 41 Holland, where Rico Verhoeven makes his first appearance in 2017, and Robin Van Roosmullen looks to reclaim the featherweight title. It's coming your way on Saturday, May 20th. Are you ready for...